Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown. This is another fact or fiction one. This was, uh, we did the first episode of this a few weeks ago, and uh, it was a bit experimental, and it went really well. The basic format is one of my writers, Kevin. He, well normally Kevin will write me a script, it'll all be true, and I'll read it, we'll have a good time. Fun, fun, fun. With the fact or fiction, Kevin, last time he presented to me five stories, and I think th two of them were fake, or three of them were fake, and I had to guess which ones were real, which ones were fake, etc. I got all of them right and Kevin was like I won't be having that let me try again and uh, did I mention that everyone loved it so we did another one of these I love doing it it's a blast um, I have another intro video from Kevin so let's watch it together and then we'll jump into the stories I would encourage you to play along at home if you're watching this on YouTube uh, let me know in the comments how you do if you're listening as a podcast you can't do that but why not leave me a review Let's see what bullshit Elon Musk is up to with this week. <laughs> oh, hello, Simon. I didn't see you there. I suppose congratulations are in order, since you got all five entrants correctly last time, but I'm an extremely sore loser. To that end, I've decided to increase the difficulty this time around. You see, I hate to see free labor go to waste, so while I was in the basement last time, I did a little conscripting of my own. Once again, you find yourself holding a script of internet mysteries. Some are real, some are fake. It is your job to determine whether each entry is a real internet mystery, a piece of fiction written by me, or a piece of fiction written by Danny. Ooh. Clearly Danny's freedom was never meant to be, so I won't be offering the same stakes as last time. I've also used a random number generator to determine the order of the entries, just so you don't try and get cute and try to predict what order I would put them in. Cheers, Simon, and I wish you the worst of luck. I had no idea. Kevin has recruited Danny. If if you're not like super into the lore of my various channels, um, which don't worry, I get confused as well. Uh, Danny writes on one of my other channels called Brain Blaze. I didn't even know Kevin knew him. Uh, I guess they were in touch somehow. I don't remember Kevin asking me for Danny's email, so maybe they connected on Twitter or something. Who knows? But uh, I've got to guess whether it's true, whether it's false. And did he say one of these is written by Danny? All right, here we go. Here we go. Fact or fiction to the revenge inning. Knights of the Eastern Calculus. There's a quick science lesson to start this entry. The Schumann Resonances, named after physicist Winfried Otto Schumann, are a portion of the Earth's electromagnetic field. They are a set of extremely low-frequency spectrum peaks that are generated and excited by lightning and were first observed in the 1800s. Ele Earth's electromagnetic field. I'm immediately skeptical of this because I've never heard of these. And I feel myself to be a little bit of a science nerd. Like, I'm not some big brain, but I do find all of this stuff super interesting. I've never heard of these. And also, I'm sure I'm wrong. I'm not so sure I'm wrong, but maybe I'm wrong. But the electromagnetic field of the Earth, isn't that a lot higher up than where lightning's at? Like, I feel like lightning is like relatively close to the ground, because sometimes it hits the ground. Whereas the electromagnetic field, I feel is like further away. Or maybe it's a part of the whole thing. I mean, obviously, because compasses work, don't they? Who knows? Let's move on. Though they were not studied extensively until decades later, they can be used to monitor and predict lightning storms and earthquakes, and in 1993, it was even suggested they could be used to monitor global warming. Because of their electrostatic properties, they could theoretically enable unhindered long-distance communications and were likely the basis behind Tesla's dream of free wireless electricity. Uh, and again, just throwing Tesla in... I feel is just one of those like, he's cool, so let's throw him into the mix. I'm so hard leaning to fake on this one, Kevin or Danny. Because I've only read one, Danny could be matching Kevin's writing style, but I have a feeling this is Kevin. Let's see how we do. I got a feeling. Enter the Knights of Eastern Calculus. No, they're not giving us free electricity because that would be beneficial to society. The Knights, presumably founded in Asia based on the name, advertised themselves to potential members as a group of elite hackers who were trying to utilize the Schumann resonances as an improved means of communication. They first appeared in 1998, so the idea of wireless digital communication was still seen as an exciting future technology rather than a fundamental part of everyday life. I was like, guys, what's wrong with 5G? What's wrong with mobile phone? While they advertise themselves on Usenet as an elite group of hackers, and I'm sure to an extent they were, at their very core, they were a cult. A f***ing 
insane cults. Kevin. I feel Kevin swears in the scripts more than Danny. They believe that if the internet could move from wires to human resonances, then it would destroy the barrier between the real and the virtual. Members quickly learned that their goal was not simply to improve technology and communication, but to abandon the flesh and upload their consciousness to the new world they thought they could create. Well, this is becoming slightly more complex because all of this stuff might not be real, but the question we've got to ask ourselves is, is this crazy group real? Are they a real internet group who really thought this was possible even if these things don't exist? Obviously, that didn't happen. We don't have the technology to upload a person's consciousness to digital form now, so God knows what would make them think we could do it back then. But cults are gonna cult, and otherwise rational people are going to get brainwashed into doing things that would never seem possible for them. On September the 28th, 1998, they initiated what the group referred to as Protocol 7, the plan to abandon and their physical forms. No information was provided on how exactly they thought they were going to do this, but I suspect it made as much sense as any other suicide cult's plan. The group was never heard from again. Except this suicide cult, they're not believing in some like weird wishy-washy meteor is gonna come and rapture them or some shit. They're believing that there's the technology to do this when they seem to be an elite group of hackers. Obviously, they'd know this is impossible because I'm not an elite hacker and I know today my consciousness is not getting up uploaded to a machine yet. Although that would be awesome and I'm very excited for when this becomes a possibility. There was that Black Mirror episode where uh, they, after people die, their consciousnesses get uploaded to a machine where they live on a beach or something. It was a weird episode. I have to say, after seeing that and a couple of other Black Mirrors that season, I stopped watching it because my mind was too bent. Like, I, w I was just thinking about that episode for like days. Just days went by and I just returned to thinking about this Black Mirror episode, which I guess is kind of the point. But it was just like, oh my god, I'm thinking about this way too much. <laughs> I've got other shit to do. This wouldn't be the first time that a cult had used the internet as a means of spreading their message as the Heaven's Gate. That's the rapture by the meteor guys. Um, their suicide had already taken place two years prior. What separates the knights from Heaven's Gate, however, is that publicly they were all merely hackers, never espousing any of their true beliefs for the masses to see. Furthermore, because the whole point of the cult was to become purely digital beings, uh, there was never any need for a centralized location. We have no idea how many members took their own lives, as they would have appeared to be unrelated suicides across the world, thus avoiding any media coverage. The vast majority of internal communication that we have regarding the Knights comes from a single 4chan user going by the name Lane, though a couple of others corroborated their story. A scouring of the Usenet archives confirmed that cult or not, the Knights of the Eastern Calculus had definitely existed as a group of hackers. We'll never know how much of Lane's account is accurate, but the story remains plausible because the members were decentralized and used internet handles instead of real names, their membership cannot be traced. Whether the Knights truly did commit mass suicide or whether they simply disbanded and stopped posting will remain an unsolvable mystery of the early internet, unless, of course, the group never existed at all. Okay, so the question is not whether any of these like radiation belts or any of that shit is real. The question is, is there a weird cult out there that believed in this stuff and i think there's two layers of depth here one this started off so unbelievable as like, i've never heard of this they're throwing in tesla this all just sounds like nonsense i think that is too obvious so and i think that probably makes this real for the very reason that i don't think kevin or danny came up with this and i think it's kevin because it's not believable enough and the people who were part of this group came up with this bullshit and then talked about it online. So I'm saying, yes, this is real. Is my logic making sense there? I realize I rambled a little bit, but I think you think you on my page, dear listener. So number one, real. Mariana's web. By this point, everyone knows there's multiple layers to the internet. There's the surface web, the portion of the web that you spend all or most of your time on. The surface web contains everything that is indexed by search engines, and while that is a whole lot of stuff, it's also only a fraction of the internet. Estimates range from the surface web being 4% of the internet to only 0.01%. Still, there's plenty to do here. You can shop online, chat with friends, like, comment, and subscribe to all of Simon's channels, all the usual stuff. But this is only layers 1 and 2 of the internet out of 8 total layers. Wait, really? There's eight layers? Did someone layer the internet? Surely, I mean, I thought it was just like, yo, there's the surface web that you can see, and then there's the non-surface web, which everyone thinks is just like, you know, people selling hits and drugs. But really, it's just like all of the stuff that isn't publicly accessible. So, I don't know, when you come across a website that says log in, that's non-surface web. You have to log in to get it. Like Netflix. Most of Netflix is non-surface web. It's 
the non-surface web. Great, brilliant description there, Simon. You know what I mean? It's like not accessible to the public. It's you got to have a password or something. Am I getting that right now? I feel like Netflix is definitely surface web, but if you need some, if it's not publicly accessible, you have to pay for it because obviously Netflix is publicly accessible, but you need a part. You need to pay. Netflix is not. Oh, who cares? Let's just move on. Layer 3 is the deep web. While it's the first hidden part of the internet, the deep web is still pretty benign, as it's composed of normal dot-com sites that aren't indexed by search engines. These websites are hidden, but not for any nefarious reasons. They simply haven't been found by spiderbots yet. The creepily named automated scripts the search engines to scour the web and index sites. The dark web is layer 4 of the internet, and it's the first layer that is intentionally hidden. Dark web sites are encrypted dot onion sites that require a special browser-like tool to access. Whenever someone talks about the deep or dark web, this is normally what they're thinking of. It's home to killers for hire, drugs, gore, and anything else illegal your black hearts desire. Yes, that's what I was thinking. But I don't think the web's de de I don't think it's divided into layers like this. I'm sure people are either screaming at the, uh, the, the screen right now being like, Simon, obviously not. Or like, Simon, you've never heard of web layers, depending on whether this is true or false. I have no idea. At least allegedly, I can promise you that there are many sites claiming to offer these products and services, but I can't promise you that they are aren't just going to take your Bitcoin and run. The above is pretty much all common knowledge, but well, <laughs> except for your small brain, Simon. But what if you want to go even deeper? The next layer of the internet is known as Mariana's Web, named after the Mariana Trench, the deepest point in the ocean. The name is a bit ironic, seeing it's only layer 5 of 8, but whatever, I'm guessing the name predates the knowledge about further layers. To go deeper in the dark web, a user must install a closed shell system into their computer. And there you can find the most disturbing illegal materials imaginable, as well as information on experimental technology like gadolinium gallium garnate quantum electronic processes. This is important because it's the next step in reaching Mariana's web. This sounds fake. This is so fake. This is fake. That is not a real thing, and it sounds like something Danny would write because he likes putting something extremely hard for me to pronounce in there. This feels mega fake, and also, I don't think a close and and, and there's also a logical problem here. Well, one, I've never heard of a closed shell system. I mean, maybe it's real. I don't know that much about computers, but I feel like I'd heard of that. I'd have heard of that. Also, if on the dark web, you're buying murder for hire, how much darker are we really going to get? Like, that is murder. It's like the worst crime. <laughs> it's murder. What's going to be like double murder? Like on layer eight, can you order a genocide? So I don't think it gets any deeper than the dark web. To access Mariana's web, you need to solve the polymetric Fahil derivation, an algorithm only solvable with the aid of quantum computers. No, computer, quantum computers are experimental. I mean, I know they exist, but not really. These computers do exist in highly specialized laboratories, but the cost of one is estimated around 15 million pounds. This is known about what is stored in Mariana's web, as so few people have the hardware required to access it. But they have shared some information about what lies deeper in the iceberg. Well, look, if there's some guys in a lab and you have to have a 15 million dollar quantum computer to access it, I don't think these guys are going to be interested in ordering hits or doing any, like, really dark stuff because they're just scientists working in some probably university laboratory they're probably like hello world <laughs> What else should we do down here? Nothing. Layer 6 is essentially the demilitarized zone. It exists simply as a separation between Mariana's web and Layer 7, nicknamed the Fog or Virus Soup. The Fog is a war zone between hackers, with everyone else trying to be the first to reach the final layer of the internet while preventing others from achieving the same goal. <laughs> what, all of these hackers with $15 million quantum computers, please? The final layer is known as the Primark system, when, and what is what controls the internet. It is an anomaly first discovered in the early 2000s that is unresponsive but randomly sends out unalterable commands the entire net. It's separated by a level 17, oh my god, I can't even pronounce that, which thus far has proved impossible to break, even with the aid of quantum computing. You may be thinking all of this has that way too many details vibe, but as you know from Cicada 3301, an unfavorable semicircle, technical mysteries require technical explanations. Maybe that's just a bluff, though. What do you think, Simon? Is Mariana's web the true deepest mystery of the internet, or is this purely fiction that I've shared in the hopes of tricking you? Did I give the plot away early by mentioning unreleased episodes or did i just give danny access to all of my scripts so he can reference them as he pleases if you ever find yourself stumped this episode you can always flip a three-sided coin i think this is fake and i think it is danny trying to sound like kevin that is my vibe on this one that last one's true <laughs> it's not it's it's, it's like ridiculously untrue vr5
Although some movies may have gotten the future laughably wrong, others have famously displayed an almost uncanny knack for making eerily accurate predictions. As early as 1902, the vintage classic A Trip to the Moon was predicting lunar exploration. The 1983 movie War Games predicted the weaponization of cyber hacking. The original Total Recall from 1990 predicted self-driving cars. Super Mario Brothers really did predict the, or I, the fall of the Twin Towers all the way back in 1993. What? Really? And of course, George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead from 1968 accurately predicted the 2015 zombie apocalypse. Okay. One of the most weirdly prescient pieces of footage ever recorded was a 45-minute episode of a short-lived science fiction show, though this particular episode was never originally broadcast. VR5 was launched by the Fox Network in 1992 and tapped into the emerging fascination with virtual reality. The 13-episode season featured Laurie Singer in the starring roles as a genius telephone engineer who becomes convinced that her father and sister died following some kind of secret VR accident, which was covered up by an influential mysterious organization only known as the committee. She later discovers that she has the ability to enter a super advanced version of VR in which she can interact with the minds of other people because of course she can. I have to say I've, been, I've got one of those Oculus Quest 2s and lately I've been playing uh, I think it's called like Golf Plus or Pro Golf Plus or something like that. I'm loving that shit. Often like between little recording sessions. I like play a few holes. It's a it's it's a good laugh. It's relaxing. The show is also notable for featuring Buffy the Vampire Slayer's Anthony Head, the librarian guy, in a recurring role. While the legendary David McCullum from The Man from Uncle and NCIS also made surprise fleeting appearances. I say surprise appearances because he played Laurie Singer's father, who had already passed away before the beginning of the first episode. But flashback sequences and a virtual reality setting still enabled the character to play a vital part. Although VR Five now enjoy something of a small cult following, it turned out to be a massive disappointment for Fox at the time. The weak initial ratings were only destined to dwindle even further until the show was cancelled after the 10th episode. The remaining three episodes were broadcast in Canada and Europe, but it would be several years before an American audience got to see them for the first time on DVD in 2007. This feels super real. I feel like this was definitely a TV show. I feel like it was and this is often something they do for some reason you'll often see like random like seasons and it's like yeah only broadcast in europe because americans hated it that much and it was the unaired 11th episode titled send me an angel which appeared to have insider knowledge of things to come although the internet didn't really begin to sit up and take notice until around 2012. the perceptive pin sharp predictions had nothing to do at all with virtual reality in fact they got that entirely wrong as the show suggested that everyone would be living inside vr headsets by the turn of the millennium disappointingly not there yet there was that episode of sliders which was a, a great 90s show i watched it again recently and i was like boy this is not aged particularly well it just looks super dated i just in my mind i'd built it up to be this incredible show and i'm like dear wife we must watch sliders together it's 90s brilliance and she was like this is a bit shit, isn't it and i was like it's not as good as i remember let's just say that and then we tried watching the outer limits together and she was like this is a bit shit, isn't it? and i was like it's not as brilliant as i remember <laughs> same exact story it's not that they were bad shows it's just that television got insanely good the weird thing about the predictions is that they weren't just the usual vague ideas that later get hailed as the work of a genius visionary you know the kind of thing in the future there will be robots and spaceships and shit. good job bud have a cookie instead the 11th episode appeared to be specifically naming tech brands that didn't actually exist yet. In one very early sequence, Anthony Head's character is seen paying digitally for items of dubious legality, something you didn't see much of in 1992 when most people were still catching diseases by exchanging dirty bits of paper. What was the name of this platform he was using? PayPal. Wow, a name that wouldn't come into existence in the real world until 2001. But I mean, it's also a, it's kind of an obvious name for like uh, paying for stuff, isn't it? Later in the episode, Ed is also depicted exchanging secretive emails with a shady acquaintance. Please don't tell me this is called Gmail. That'd be nuts. The name of the email service briefly appears right at the top of the screen. The logo looked completely different to anything we might recognize, but the name is clearly Hotmail, a word that will become much more familiar in 1996. I remember, is Hotmail still around? Weren't they bought by, is it, did Microsoft buy Hotmail at some point? God, I don't remember, but I do remember Hotmail back in the day. About halfway through the episode, we're introduced to a character known only by the code name of Angel Fire, the same name of the massively popular website hosting service which would launch just a few years later. Laurie Singer's character is later introduced to what appears to be an early version of the social networking site called Friendster. It might have been more impressive if they'd gone with Facebook, but the lesser known Friendster was a real-life social media platform which preceded Facebook by a whole year. 
and didn't do very well apparently i've heard of friends to though i don't I, I was never on it i think it was on what was that one before was that myspace does myspace still exist i can't believe i almost forgot the name of myspace for a second <laughs> And we even get a brief glimpse of a character called Jeeves. Admittedly, he's not a butler and has nothing remotely to do with answer engines, but in an episode seemingly stuffed with big names yet to come, it does seem odd that the pioneering Ask Jeeves was still four years away, or maybe it was just more of a common name back then than we remember. I don't think so, because those people would still be around, and I don't know anyone called Jeeves. There's one more curious point. While the writing duties for the other 12 episodes of VR5 were shared between the same small team, Send Me an Angel is the only episode written by Jason K. Kendi. The thing about Jason Kendi is that his IMDb profile contains nothing else aside for this credit, which is beyond unusual. The guy came out of nowhere, wrote an episode for a major Fox series, and then disappeared into obscurity forever. It was almost certainly a pseudonym, but why would the writer of this mysterious episode be hiding behind a fake name? I'm not suggesting that anyone involved with VR5 could gaze accurately into the future. It could just be a huge coincidence. Some of the big names, such as PayPal and Hotmail, might even be considered fairly predictable, but five big names in, of the future in one single episode is a big coincidence, especially considering the rest of the series failed to predict anything at all. One intriguing theory is that many of the future leaders of tech were big fans of the show, and it was some kind of big collaborative inside joke to pluck out names for their new companies and services from the very same episode of a failed TV series. But they must have been massive fans of VR5, considering that the episode in question was never even broadcast in America and wouldn't get DVD release until well over a decade later. Well yeah I, I i mean okay uh but these tech companies they could have people from all over like didn't no paypal was founded by someone else um oh the super famous guy uh who destroyed um gorka <laughs> like a legend was it peter teal was peter teal paypal and then elon musk had x.com and they merged together or something i read his biography and i've, I've forgotten the details but he was Canadian or South African then Canadian Elon Musk he didn't come up with the name PayPal I don't think he liked it look all of this is entirely possible and I'm totally believing this one even though it's a hell of a coincidence what do you think Simon was Jason Kenzie a pseudonym for someone in the PayPal mafia was this just a natural coincidence or has this all been a step too far into virtual reality no I love it I think this one's totally real and I think it's a fascinating coincidence so how are we so far I've got real fake and written by Danny real and then two more I'm going to write these down. Much, much, much later. Owen High's final video. Owen Hay, uh, there's a pronunciation guide for me. Owen Hay was a South Korean actress who began her career in 2011 in the movie Sin of a Family. It seems like she was on the fast track to becoming to a successful career until the 16th Buhan International Film Festival later that year. Inhe showed up to the event wearing a beautiful but revealing orange dress. The very conservative South Korea did not care for this. She suddenly found herself blacklisted, unable to find any acting roles except the occasional role as a femme fatale character, a type of role she did not enjoy portraying. With acting seemingly no longer an option, Inhe turned to YouTube and to music. She created a beauty vlogging channel, including both videos and live streams, and tried to launch a career as a singer. Her channel was gaining momentum, and she had even she had even recorded a duet with another K-pop singer. But on September the 14th, 2020, the unthinkable happened. A friend came over to check on her and found her on the floor, unconscious and unresponsive. She was rushed to the hospital where she was briefly revived, but died shortly thereafter due to cardiac arrest. The investigation showed no signs of foul play, and her official cause of death was suicide. I feel this was only a couple of years ago, September, year and a half ago. I feel I might have heard of this. Like, if a YouTuber dies, generally I subscribe to, like, the YouTuber, like, newsletters and, and um, you know, the, the stuff, the news in the YouTube world. I feel like I would have heard of this. Fans weren't buying this at all and immediately saw her final vi YouTube video and Instagram posts as evidence that she knew something would happen to her. The first sign something might be amiss was the title of the video. Inhei's videos were all titled sequentially, Episode 1, Episode 2, etc. Her previous video had been Episode 45, but the final video was Episode 48. Mistakes happen, so that's not much on its own. However, at 48 seconds into the video, when she started combing her hair, the video starts a strange buffering error. The audio continues as normal, but the video keeps repeating the same few frames, showing in high quickly, bringing the comb directly down to her neck as if she's trying to ch cut or chop her head off. Oh my god. 
This continues for a full minute, ending at 1 minute and 48 seconds into the video. The time on the clock on the wall reads 8.30, meaning the hands are by 8 and 6. 8 times 6 is 48. She was found unconscious 48 hours after the video was published. She was born in 1984, the reverse of 48, and weighed 48 kilograms. Okay, yeah, well, those are just coincidences. Those last two are definitely a stretch, but you know how fans are. The number 48 has also has some meaning in numerology, but there's no evidence that Ian Hai believed in numerology any more than you or I do. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> if you're like, numerology's real, Simon! <laughs> it's not. It's not. You should stop wasting your time on that nonsense. Inai was also well known to edit and upload her videos, so she was clearly aware of the issue, but chose not to fix the video. Mm, sometimes. Sometimes I've made mistakes like this, and it's like, okay, well, you're watching the video in like Premiere Pro, you're like editing it or whatever, and then it looks completely fine, so you export it and you upload it. And then there's some error during the export that made it go funky, and you're like, okay. Well, now if I take it down and re-upload it, no one's gonna watch it, so it'll do terribly on YouTube. So you're like, well, I guess I'm just stuck with that error in there. When a viewer has commented on the buffering in the videos, she just simply edited the title of the video, saying to skip the buffering part rather than editing it out. To a lot of her fans, this video was proof that she was warning about what was about to happen. There was also one other strange piece of evidence that surfaced later, a final post on Instagram that was uploaded the day of her death and deleted approximately an hour later. The post was an image of a flower tagging the user Wang He along with a caption. Wang He was a lawyer who has since deleted his account and he was never investigated on the basis that there was no evidence that the two ever knew one another. I'd have thought that this post was evidence enough to at least talk to him a little bit, but that's why I'm a writer and not a detective. I'm also a writer who doesn't speak Korean, so I'm going to have to trust others on what the caption says. It's noted that the message contained a lot of errors, but it translated roughly as follows. Everything is my fault. I don't like blaming others. It's hard to give my heart to someone. I'm not drunk. My phone is not working properly. You're watching this, right? The person that called me just a piece of body, asking me to forgive with love and i love you this is criminal i will show you and get you in trouble i will never believe anything that comes out of your mouth you need to be punished i think this is the only way for arrogant people like you i am sad that doesn't sound like a broken phone that does sound like you're drunk or having some sort of episode this starts off sounding like a depressed monologue then suddenly it changes to become rather threatening with inhei's death ruled suicide thus ending any official investigation the two clues are all we have to go on was her death a carefully planned suicide with an advanced warning to the fans or was there something more nefarious at play and she was predicting her death at the hands of wang ha perhaps it was all a coincidence a sloppily edited and titled video by a woman battling her anger and depression. On the surface, that would appear possible, but a seemingly healthy woman having a heart attack at only 36 seems even more unlikely than the other options. Yeah, but it's it's unlikely, but it's certainly not impossible. With no real investigation to speak of and the method of suicide never disclosed, whether Inhe was warning fans of her losing battle with depression or her fears for her life from someone else will forever remain a mystery. What do you think, Simon? Was Inhe's death a murder, suicide, or natural causes? Or did I just make all this up on the assumption that you don't watch a lot of Korean beauty vlogs? This one is tricky. Now, at first I was like, I didn't believe it was real because I feel like I'd have heard of this, the death of the youtuber but then they could be a small youtuber uh i don't know how many subscribers they have to i don't think uh kevin or maybe danny but i feel kevin i don't think he said so i think maybe i didn't hear of it because it wasn't a particularly big notable person who died um and i feel it's just a bit boring no offense kevin or danny i just feel it's like the story itself is too boring to have been made up by your beautiful creative minds so i'm gonna say that this one is also real and i do think it's written by kevin why is my computer every time i log in asking me for my password why can't you just read my fingerprint that's what the thing is there for so this one is also real so right now we've got three real and one fake so unless kevin has really stacked the deck one way or the other i think this next one's got to be fake right yeah yeah bebis one this entry is dedicated to angering everyone who requested I cover 
Polybius in the comment section for the Publius Enigma. Is this Kevin writing, or was this a fed line? I think it's Kevin! In June 1989, an issue of Video Games and Computer Entertainment, there was an advertisement for a mail-order video game service named Play It Again. Near the end of their list of Nintendo games for sale was the title Yeah Yeah Be This One, a game nobody had ever heard of. That October, a similar ad from a rival mail-order service named Funko also contained the game. The game appeared in ads from both companies through January 1990, and then it disappeared appeared. There are no contemporary references to these games anywhere besides ads for these two companies and the theories about what Yeah Yeah Beebus was are numerous. Two theories are that it was either a placeholder name, something randomly inserted to make the list fill up the entire page, or an insider joke. These are both plausible and impossible to verify without explicit confirmation from someone working at these companies. Another theory is that the game's real identity was Super Pitfall 2, a cancelled sequel for the popular Super Pin Pitfall game. You're welcome to research that theory if you want, but it reads like the direct train of thought of a South Park's version of Ian, Dr. Ian Malcolm. I have no idea. I've never seen South Park. I don't know who Dr. Ian Malcolm is. This joke is completely lost on me. I've also got no idea about these old computer games. This one could be real. I'm so pushing towards fake because there's been three real ones and only one fake one. But it feels real, doesn't it? It's a crazy feeling. That leaves with the final two theories and the most realistic. The first is that this was a copyright trap. The idea was to put a fake title in their list just to use as proof if another company was stealing their ad. There are two major pieces of evidence to support this. The first is that in both the Play It Again and Funko ads, Yeah Yeah Beavis is incorrectly alphabetized, coming between WrestleMania and Xenophobe. The second piece comes from an interview with one of the founders of Play It Again in 2021. Yes, it's over 30 years later and people really do care about stuff like this still. In the interview, co-founder Neil Levin said that the person running the company would often do these copyright traps, a common business practice at the time, but he had no specific recollection of Yeah Yeah Beavis being one of them. It's a strong case, but it lacks specific confirmation. I don't understand what a copyright trap is. I don't know how this gets people caught for like copyright infringement or something. Am I too small brain? I guess I must be. The other credible theory is that name was quickly and a poorly localized version of the Japan-only release Rai Rai Kionshi's Baby Kion she no Amida Daiboken. Holy shit. <laughs> from Bandai. The Rai Rai bit at the beginning is very similar to Yeah Yeah, and the word baby easily could have been translated as Beebus. <laughs> Note that the title you read or likely struggled to read, then possibly gave up on. I just struggled. I struggled my way valiantly through, Kevin. I think, Kevin. Written using Japanese characters, so the baby to Beebus era makes more sense. The game also happened to be released in 1989, a few months before these ads started appearing. Another important fact is that while Rai Rai Kenoshi's remained a Japanese Japan exclusive game, the Play It Again ad did include other important titles such as Dragon Ninja, the Japanese version of the game Bad Dukes, both of which also released in 1989. If you're unfamiliar, as I'm sure you are, Simon, Bad Dukes is a side-scrolling beat-em-up where you need to prove that you are a bad enough dude to say President Ronnie from Ninjas. President Ronnie. <laughs> okay, this game sounds uh, bad, and I've never heard of it, no. I want to believe the last theory is true, and there's a fairly strong case for it, but the copyright trap is honestly the more likely candidate. Until we find someone at one of these two companies who can actually remember the full story, we'll never know for sure. Of course, while I know you're a fan of GTA, Simon, I doubt you give a shit about a rare Japanese import NES game. You're absolutely right, Kevin. Uh, perhaps I just made up a story about something you would care so little about that you'll probably just guess randomly with no thought to get through this last entry as fast as possible. Um, no, I find the idea of copyright traps interesting, though. I think this is true. <laughs> and I'm saying it's true again because I think it's boring. And I'm going against my gut here to think that there is only one fake entry because I think I got the last ones quite easily. That Kevin is trying intentionally to throw me off by putting four fake, uh, four real and one fake in um but i'm going with my gut feeling to say this is real because i think it's boring but however that might just be because i find this discussion of 80s video games boring but let us find out because we have a video from kevin so to recap real fake written by danny real 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 oh it's you again I suppose it's time to reveal the answers once more the events of the eastern calculus were a group of highly skilled hackers in the 1990s while it's true that many of them committed suicide, it was a lie that their identities could not be traced. Once a list of the members of the Knights of the Eastern Calculus was released, the members all either committed suicide or were assassinated. 
and to the viewer response to the Death Gun story last episode, I would be remiss not to try to fool you with another anime plot. So of course these events are actually based on what happened in Serial Experiments Lane, a 1998 anime. Damn it! Last episode, Chip Chan was the entry I was most worried about you having already heard of. This time around, Mariana's Web was the entry I felt confident you would be most likely to have heard of, as it has been reported by a number of respected news outlets and YouTubers. But last time around, I was hoping you hadn't heard of Chip Chan. And this time around, I was hoping you had heard of Mariana's Web. While it's often reported as fact, Mariana's Web is just a fake internet rumor that stems from a single internet iceberg image. The entire thing is bullshit techno babble designed to prey on the fear and curiosity of people who don't understand technology. Big brain. VR5 Got it. was a terrible show on Fox that only aired 10 of the 13 episodes that were recorded. While the show did have numerous writers, episode 11, Send Me an Angel, did not have a mysterious bonus writer. The fake pseudonym Jason Kendi is actually an anagram for Danny's joke, because aside from a few small changes to remove British slang, this entry was written entirely by Danny. Damn it! <laughs> there are a lot of rumors and speculations surrounding the death of O. Yun Hay, though the investigation seems to lack even the most basic elements of due diligence. While the official story remains that she committed suicide, I'm not really convinced that's the case. Either way, unfortunately, this mystery is real. Finally, that brings us to Yeah Yeah Be This One. While it may have worked as a copyright trap based on the incorrect alphabetization in the Funko ad as well as the Play It Again ad, it doesn't necessarily mean it was intended as one. I'm more inclined to believe that this was a sloppy localization of Rai Rai Kyochis. Either way, this internet mystery is very real. And it sparked so much interest that an indie developer actually released Yeah Yeah Beavis 2 for the Nintendo Switch. So how did you do, Simon? Were Danny and I able to pull one over on you? Okay, to, so, so to sum up, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna start watching anime or some shit because last time uh, Kevin wrote another anime plot and I totally called it out as fake. And this time he used another anime plot and I was like, yeah, that sounds real. No, it wasn't real. Um, so I got that wrong. Uh, then I got the fake one with all the techno babble right, although I thought it was written by Danny. It was just, just complete techno babble. I was so 100% sure about that one. Then the third one about the, the brands appearing in the TV show? I was convinced that, I thought that was legit. I really thought that was, like, real. Turns out the TV show was real, all this stuff was real, but that episode was never written. And that was Danny's, Danny's one, so I got that wrong. And then I got the last two ones right about the uh, South Korean woman and the um, 1980s video one, which I was like, this is so boring, it's real. <laughs> so I got those, th uh, what did I get? Three out of five. It's not exactly a stellar score, is it? But it was all right. How did you do at home, dear viewers? Don't cheat and let me know in the comments below if you liked this uh, fact or fiction. We'll do another one. I like it. It's fun for me. It's like a game. I mean, it is a game. That's what it is. And you get to play along as well. Thank you, everybody, for listening or watching. And I shall see you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.